everyone at Smyrna and others that may be listening. It's a pleasure to be with you and to share with you today. Before we get started, I invite you to have a word of prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful that we can be called the children of God. We're grateful for the wonderful plan of salvation. We thank you for giving us the scriptures such a precious treasure and wealth of information, practical, theoretical, that will enable us to be transformed back into the image of our Creator, which we lost through sin. So we thank you and we pray that you will in a special way be with us as we share this message today. I pray for your spirit to anoint your servant with a coal from off the altar, and we ask that Each one of our hearts may be receptive, that it may be clear and clean of any hindrances that would prevent us from understanding the the words that you have for us today. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have pre-recorded the message today, but I hope also to be with you in person as uh, this is being shared, but just in case there are issues with with technology, with signal, or other circumstances, I have pre-recorded this so that uh, we can be sure and, and have this available for you at the right time. The theme, the days of Noah, is significant because this deals with also the time that we're living in, and I'm sure that's why the theme was chosen. But the aspect, uh, and there are many possible aspects that we could consider, the aspect of the days of Noah that we will be considering in this study is the inventions of the antediluvians and why that matters. In Matthew twenty four thirty seven, we read, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The conditions of the earth at the time of Noah were very different in many respects, and we're going to consider some of those respects at this time. Firstly, the geomagnetic field, according to NASA and and other agencies that have, have researched this, the geomagnetic field at the time that that we understand the flood to have taken place and creation to have taken place was approximately ten times stronger than it is now. Since around 1845, uh, the the magnetic field of the earth has been um, measured yearly, and it has been decreasing exponentially. And and so scientists can calculate the approximate uh, magnetic field as it used to be a certain number of years ago. Now, life needs a magnetic field. They have NASA has done studies where they placed Um, chicken eggs in space, and those that were recently fertilized did not not hatch. Those that had been fertilized for longer periods of time did hatch. But at the embryo stage, when life was forming in the egg, it needed that magnetic field that, that the Earth has. And other studies have been done on plants and and so forth. And life needs a small amount of magnetic field, geomagnetic field, to survive. But if it gets too much, life will cease to exist. But the ramifications of this would be would be significant in many areas, and we'll see one of those areas a little bit later on. But but one of those things is that that electricity would have been much easier to to create, it's easier to harness, and various other things. But we'll discuss that a little bit more. Now, here's just one example of a chart that shows the the various uh, degrees of magnetic field at diff- in different years. And the, this chart is quite long. I'll only put a small portion of it here from NASA. But another aspect of the differences that existed at that time, from the fossil record, they have found that the dinosaurs' lungs capacity in many cases were too small to support the size of animal that the fossil indicates, and it would be impossible to for it to survive unless 
the atmosphere was changed. If the atmosphere was changed to, to be greater and oxygen was increased a little bit, then life would have been able to, to exist in those large creatures. Another, another thing was that animals that seemed to have had wings, certain dinosaurs that, that had wings, it would have been impossible for them to fly under current atmospheric conditions. But if the atmosphere was, was greater, the amount of lift capability is increased, is directly increased. If you had a double atmospheric pressure, then the lift would be double. So in other words, it would take half the, the effort to be able to fly or half the wingspan, etc. if it was doubled. But for various reasons, it has been postulated by a scientist, Dr. Carl Baugh and others. Uh, I believe he has at least 50 that work with him at the Creation Science Museum there. But quite a few people, scientists, have postulated that from the evidence they can, they can gather, the atmospheric pressure was greater than it is now. And they estimate somewhere around 22 psi instead of the 14 point something that it is currently. And this would have would have created difference in, as I mentioned, the ability to fly and and also it would have saturated the pressure, would have saturated the plasma of the blood with oxygen, giving greater strength, greater resistance to disease and various various things like that, greater healing speed. Another difference in, in the earth pre-flood era is that metals and precious stones lay on the surface. We read uh, from the servant of the Lord in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 107, that by the same means, the silver and gold, the choice wood and precious stones, which had enriched and adorned the world before the flood in which the inhabitants had idolized, were concealed from the sight and search of men. The violent action of the waters piling earth and rocks upon these treasures, and in some cases, even forming mountains above them. Speaking of the time of the flood when when these things were were covered so the silver the gold precious stones wood etc these things were much more easily accessible prior to the flood there was much more availability of these things now if we're talking about silver gold and precious stones we're we're very likely also speaking about other other precious metals, platinum, iron, etc., and and many rare earth magnet magnetic materials, perhaps, and and all sorts of things that we're we're just finding out today. Another difference at the time of the flood, prior to the time of the flood, is that the trees were vastly larger. We read here in in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume One, the trees were vastly larger and far surpassing in beauty and perfect proportions anything mortals can now look upon the wood of those trees of these trees was of fine grain and hard substance in this respect more like stone it required much more time and labor even of that powerful race to prepare the timber for building than it requires in this degenerate age to prepare trees that are now growing upon the earth even with the present weaker strength men now possess, these trees were of great durability and would know nothing of decay for many years. I was working on, on uh, building a deck for my parents in San Diego, and uh, my father had had a lot of trouble with his redwood deck prior to this time, that had continually gotten dry rot and, and bugs, and he had replaced um, replaced the boards many different times, and and it continued to have a problem. So we decided to use a, a different wood, and after researching, we found a wood that we could use called Ipe, Ipe, which was from uh, Brazil, and it was a very hard wood. We, we got some of this, and it wouldn't even float. It sank. And it was not possible to drive a nail in this wood. Uh, you had to pre-drill for your nails. And we ended up using this wood, and it's still still uh, looking great today without any signs of rot or bugs or, 
or anything else. And this is perhaps two decades later, something like that. And the, uh, but this reminds me perhaps of the type of wood that, that you would have found pre-flood era, a uh, very hard, it would have been very difficult to cut this wood into lumber. Um, this says that it was more like stone, but the antediluvians had some, some technology, I believe, and we're going to see more of my reasons here shortly. They had some tremendous technology that would have enabled them to, to build a structure like the ship that Noah built. Another aspect that was different in the times before the flood was were that the human race were taller and stronger. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1 says, The race of men then living was of very great stature and possessed wonderful strength. Another aspect, these people had musical instruments. They had brass and iron inventions. They had instructors of metallurgy. We read here in Genesis 4, 21 and 22, His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled a harp an organ. And Zilla, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So they ha actually had a school running with its, with its instructor teaching people um, in metallurgy. That is the art of combining different metals to, and forming different things out of, out of these different metals. But in Genesis 6, 5, we read the following, that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, if you know anything about the Hebrew language, you know that it's a concrete language and abstract things like imagination or thoughts, the abstract terms are formed by concrete words. Uh, words that refer to concrete things. And, and I want us to take a closer look at these two words in this passage. It says in Isaiah, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay, for shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not, or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. This is the word, a usage of the word that we saw moments ago that refers to imagination. The thing here it's translated thing framed. In Second Chronicles twenty six fifteen, he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal, and his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. And this is the word that's translated in that verse there that we read Genesis 6, 5 as thoughts. But here we see it's translated as invented. That same word we find in the following passages, Exodus 31, 4 and 35, 32, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and silver and brass, and to devise curious works to work in gold and in silver and in brass. So these inventions um, of gold, silver, and brass were called by the same word that's translated thought in the other verse. Once again in Exodus 35, 33, cunning work. In Exodus 35, 35, cunning work. And in Second Chronicles 2.14, notice it says, and to find out every device which shall be put to him. This, this uh, find out every device lends itself even more so to the idea of an invention. An invention, just as it was translated in Second Chronicles 26.15, invented. But in Genesis 6.5, going back there, 
understanding the words that we have just seen translated in other places, different ways. I believe that that we could translate this passage with not only the abstract meaning of the words, but also taking into account the concrete meaning. And so we could aptly translate Genesis 6, 5 in the following way. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that everything framed of the inventions of his heart was only evil continually. And that's why in our subtitle at the top, I say, Every invention was evil continually. What are some examples of the inventions of the antediluvians? Well, we will take a look at some of those things today. We're going to take a look at another one of those things tomorrow, more, much more in detail. But firstly, I'll draw your attention to 25 black boxes that are made of solid granite, weighing about 100 tons, including the box and the lid. And they have precision, laser-like cuts in this granite rock, this solid granite rock. Each box was found empty, so they don't know the purpose of these box. But... Weighing it at a hundred tons, being found in a in a small passage in underneath a, a pyramid, left scientists and archaeologists baffled. How could they possibly have not only cut these things, but how they could have transported them? And typical Egyptology um, says that the people had merely copper tools at the time that these boxes seem to have been made. And they were, they were quarried in Aswan about 500 miles away. How would they have brought them there? These things are much older than ancient Egyptian history reveals. The pyramids surrounding them and the hieroglyphics found in and around uh, the the places where they're found also are much later than than the boxes themselves, according to their their understanding of the the dates of these things. And so nobody seems to really know how they came into existence, when or where. And it's very possible that they were found and then these these monuments were built above them and around them. But another box similar is found on Elephantine Island. And this has, once again, precision cut, smooth glass-like mirrored um, surfaces in this granite. And far beyond what scientists' knowledge previously has shown to be possible to these uh, to these Egyptians at the time that these stones would have had to have been made. So it has left things, left scientists a little baffled. Also, how did this thing get moved to this particular location and what forces could have broken it? Being so immensely strong and, and thick and heavy. And so it, it appears that the people that made these would have had to have had some kind of high-tech construction tools to be able to um, cut solid granite and methods and modes of transport that we little dream of. Now, another thing that has left scientists rather baffled is a village called Asuka in Japan. It contains multiple carved granite stones in particular shapes. Now, these are not small stones. These are very large ones. This one in the picture is 36 feet by 26 feet and by 15 feet high, made of solid granite, weighing approximately 800 tons. And it has two precision cuts all the way through from the top to the bottom, 15 feet through this, this solid granite stone. And it's, it's um, man-made, precise, 90-degree 
cuts about one meter by one meter in size. And it has two of these. It has scientists baffled what could have been the use of these things. How could they have cut this stone in this way? And how they could have transported these stones? And no one seems to know when they were done and how they got here, etc. I just speculate, and it's just speculation, but it possibly could have been cut to hold some columns, some posts, massive posts to hold up some huge structure, but that's just a speculation. Nobody really knows what it could have been for. But in Peru, at Machu Picchu, not only do they have the ancient ruins that date to about 550 years ago by the Incas, but they also have some other much larger megaliths that are um, made of stone that are, once again, perfectly cut angles, perfectly precision cut edges, making a mortarless construction, very different from the Incan construction. They put rocks together with with mortar of clay, and this is a totally different different thing here. And these have knobs carved in the in the stone, protruding at certain places where it would be likely to have joined walls or pillars to these things. And once again, these are thousands of years old, and nobody knows when really this was was made. Another thing that is truly baffling is you can see the, the people in this picture here um, on top of this stone. Obviously, this stone was cut by human hands. It is not naturally occurring that it would be perfectly rectangular in size, and it's obviously a, a very carefully properly cut stone and it weighs about 1200 tons and you can guess perhaps how large it is by by seeing the people walking about on top of this thing and it's found in Lebanon and weighing about 1200 tons makes you wonder how in the world they hoped to transport this this huge stone and how they would have cut it even the machines that we have today i don't know that that it would have been possible to do very much with this stone even with present day machinery to have hauled it somewhere in peru there's another place um, that has more of these perfectly engineered stones large large stones that are perfectly engineered with with nubs sticking out for for holding them for transporting them for for joining other walls or or whatever another invention of the antediluvians are their numerous cities um, obviously if they had the ability to cut these stones and and form them into large buildings and so forth. They would have been building cities. Here we see um, off the coast of Bahamas an underwater city that was discovered, I believe, in 1968. But it it is what appears to be a paved street made of huge blocks of rectangular and polygonal shaped stones underwater. And it's about 15 or about five meters the the longest one of these stones they're they're very large stones and perfectly sculpted others have postulated this may be the top of a huge wall of an ancient city but the point is that this is deep under the under the water in 1969 the crew of the u.s submarine illuminat found what it believes to be an underwater city 900 meters below the surface of the water they found a 20-kilometer avenue, and once again, it's an unexplained phenomena. Why are cities under the water and under so much water? Off the coast of Japan, in 1987, Yonaguni Island, 
There is a megalithic formation found 40 meters below the surface. And one marine biologist has studied this for 50, um, these underwater structures for 15 years. And he says that this is an ancient 5,000 year old city. Off the coast of Cuba, 600 meters down uh, with the help of a robotic submarine, they have discovered an area of over 20 square kilometers covered in structures like pyramids and other man-made buildings. Now, we've already mentioned they must have had some pretty, pretty fancy tools uh, in order to be able to cut stones the way that they did. People in modern times cut these stones with large circular saws that have diamond in, embedded in them, epoxied on the blades, and these are, are saws that cut with water to keep the blade cool from warping and damaging the blade. And it's not an easy thing to do. It requires some technology. In London, Texas, a couple named Frank and Emma Hahn discovered this piece of wood sticking out of stone. And it was very old wood, they could see. So they took it home. Their, their son had been a professor for a while, and he, he chipped the stone away containing this, this piece of wood and found a hammer head in the stone. This was in 1934. This hammer was analyzed, and it was discovered that it was composed of 96.6% iron. 74% sulfur and 2.6 chlorine. This combining of chlorine with iron is not possible with, certain, uh, with current scientific methods, meaning that they had some sort of capabilities with metallurgy that we don't now possess. They filed a little nick in it that you can see in this picture, and it's still shiny after the last 90 years or so since this was found. This was a wonderfully um, made stainless steel hammerhead. Here's another picture of it, still embedded in, in some of the rock encasing it. Another thing that was discovered near Baghdad in 1936 were some, some batteries. They have made um, identical batteries to, to what these were, and produced a voltage at around 0.87 volts to 2 volts, depending on which electrolyte you use. And they used electrolytes that they deemed were possible to have been used at that time, such as wine or vinegar, etc. And a small voltage is produced. And just like modern car batteries or other batteries, by combining cells, you you create batteries, a bank of battery cells uh, will create a battery of, of a voltage of whatever you want. 12 volt batteries can be made up of six to eight cells wired in series so that they produce the higher voltage. Not just one or, or even two of these batteries were found, but quite a few batteries. On the next slide, there's, I won't read it, but there's an, there were a number of finds of batteries of different sizes, even small batteries similar to our AA batteries. These contained copper plates. They contained iron rods that were suspended in the middle of this clay pot and, and rods, iron rods or copper rods, some were copper, some were iron, that would have connected the, the cells together. The rods that were suspended in these in these pots showed signs of acid corrosion. And from all the evidences, the only thing these could have been were batteries. They don't believe that the people at this time where this was found had the technology to do something like this. Um, they believe that they must have received that technology through some instruction dating much further back than, than their time. 
Now, these batteries would not have been prehistoric or, or pre-flood era, but the technology to have done this would have come from someplace. To even know about the existence of, of electricity would have had to have come from ancient generations. And all of this indicates to me that they, they very likely would have had electricity pre-flood era. Now, moving on, we find that there were maps that have been created um, in more recent days that were based on, on more ancient maps that reveal things that, that have astounded um, scientists and archaeologists today. Um, there's what's called the Xeno map, and it outlines the coast of modern-day Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Scotland, Germany, and it includes the exact longitude and latitude of a number of islands. They don't understand this because it would have required the use of a chronometer, a device that was not invented till 1765. And these Xeno maps predate that by, by a long time. And it also shows modern day Greenland free of glaciers. So whatever maps that they used to, to make this map, someone must have had a knowledge of or seen a map of the time when after the flood, just prior to the, the time when, when the area was co covered with glaciers. In 1737, a map was published by Philip Bach, it is believed to have been created with the use of much more ancient maps. This shows Antarctica before the, the continent was covered with ice. And it accurately depicts Antarctica with no ice. It accurately positioned the Canary Island and also displays the correct outline of the underwater plateau on which the islands are located. And this shows that the, the source maps that were used to create this existed prior to the time of the continent being covered with ice. There's also the Orance Fine world map created in 1534. And it shows the features of Antarctica not covered with ice. It also shows continent rivers, valleys, and coastlines, the approximate location of what is the South Pole today. Skipping to the Orontes map here now, in 1531, it shows Antarctica before it was discovered and how it looked ice-free, showing mountains, valleys, rivers, etc. The Piri Rice map was composed around 1520, and it also displays Antarctica without ice and accurately depicts the geography of the American continent with such a precision that it looks as if it was put together with the aid of aerial photography. Interestingly, this map was examined by the U.S. Hydrographic Office of the Navy where its authenticity was confirmed. The map was proven genuine and is so accurate that it is purportedly used to correct errors in some modern maps. Some of these things make you question how certain things could have been that way. As I have analyzed some of this data, it's led me to conclude that some of the source maps were of the time just after the flood, but previous to possibly the, the time when great earthquakes or, or other events happened which caused a caused ice to to form on the polar regions the source maps in fact one of these claims to have used more than 20 source maps and then combined them and edited them taking what seemed to be the most accurate rendering after comparing all these different maps so so i'm thinking that that some of these maps probably were pre-flood era trans transmitted verbally to offspring after the flood. Keep in mind that they lived for another, some of them, you know, would have lived for hundreds of years after the flood and transmitted that knowledge to their offspring. And some could have been 
of the time period shortly after the flood before the ice formed and then some shortly after that so obviously there was some some understanding of navigation and there must have been some navigation tools far back in history to say the very least and they would have gotten this knowledge from some place they also would have had to have some some navigation tools and not only that as this piri rice map indicates some of these things look like they could only have been done with aerial photography this leads us to the question was it possible for the antediluvians to have flown or had drones fly did they have photographic equipment etc well i will leave that question with you to answer in a few minutes after we have read some some other things here in signs of the times february 1 we read from the servant of the lord fresh from the hand of the creator these descendants of adam possessed capabilities that we do not now see but they forgot god and so it is today men have sought out many inventions but what is the influence exerted by the improvements and the abundant facilities for intercourse that are everywhere seen men have not kept god's commandments and therefore the railways the telegraph wires the cables that connect the king nations and kingdoms of the earth have not brought the fallen world any nearer the higher world now she talks about inventions that have not exerted a, a good influence she talks specifically um, inventions that she mentions in this context are railways telegraph wires cables in other words transportation and communication inventions and she says starting out the paragraph that these descendants of adam possessed capabilities that we do not now see and so in the context of railways telegraph wires and cables she is telling us that these don't compare with the inventions pre-flood era in patriarchs and prophets it says could illustrate illustrious scholars of our time be placed in contrast with men of the same age who lived before the flood they would appear as greatly inferior in mental as in physical strength as the years of man have decreased and his physical strength has diminished so his mental capacities have lessened there are men who now aptly now apply themselves to study during a period of from 20 to 50 years and the world is filled with the admiration of their attainments but how limited are these acquirements in comparison with those of men whose mental and physical powers were developing for centuries it contrasts men of our day with men of their day as being far inferior mentally reading on it says adam had learned from the creator the history of creation he himself witnessed the events of nine centuries and he imparted his knowledge to his descendants the antediluvians were without books they had no written records but with their great physical and mental vigor they had strong memories able to grasp and to retain that which was communicated to them and in turn to transmit it unimpaired to their posterity and for hundreds of years there were seven generations living upon the earth contemporaneously having the opportunity of consulting together and profiting each by the knowledge and experience of all and once again in strength of intellect men who now live can bear no comparison to the ancients there have been more ancient art lost than the present generation now possess for skill and art those living in this degenerate age will not compare with the knowledge possessed by strong men who lived near 1,000 years. And this word arts is not simply referring, I don't believe, to pretty things, to sculptures or, or paintings. This is talking about arts in the sense of the artisans, in the sense of inventions. In Patriarchs and Prophets reading on, it says, it is true that the people of modern times have the benefit of the attainments of their predecessors the men of masterly minds who planned and studied and wrote have left their work for those who follow but even in this respect and so far as merely human knowledge now notice we're talking about human knowledge is concerned how much greater the advantages of the men of that olden time 
They had among them for hundreds of years him who was formed in God's image, whom the Creator himself pronounced good, the man whom God had instructed in all the wisdom pertaining to the material world. The material world has to do with physics, with chemistry, with science. God himself had instructed Adam. I don't believe our modern inventions have even compared today with what they had prior to the flood. Notwithstanding the wickedness of the antediluvian world, that age was not, as has often been supposed, an era of ignorance and barbarism. The people were granted the opportunity of reaching a high standard of moral and intellectual attainment. They possessed great physical and mental strength and their advantages for acquiring both religious and scientific knowledge, were unrivaled. Unrivaled. That's talking about by people today. Their science was far superior to ours. You know, in 2014, scientists um, created a magnetic field trapped in a superconductor at 17.6 Tesla. And that's a standard of, of measuring magnetic flux density. This is equal to three tons, that's 6,000 pounds of force inside a golf ball sized object. This force causes this object to be levitated and fixed in its position. You can move it sideways from side to side within this magnetic field as long as it stays in that mag magnetic field, but you can't pull it out of that magnetic field. You can't push it down to the thing that it's it's levitating above it just levitates in that fixed position using this technology they have done some models of trains that glide along this this surface uh, levitating upside down sideways any direction just fixed in a magnetic field creating a frictionless uh, surface with the magnetic field in the earth much greater than it is now and with scientific knowledge much greater than it is now. Our minds, I don't believe, really comprehend what they were capable of doing prior to the flood. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, God saw that the more he enriched and prospered sinful men, the more they would corrupt their ways before him. The treasures that should have led them to glorify the bountiful giver had been worshipped while God had been dishonored and despised. They worship the creature rather than the creator. You know, ancient Babylon was characterized by its riches and merchandise. We read in Daniel 4.30, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? In Daniel 5, Daniel tells the story in, in summary of what happened when Nebuchadnezzar did that. It says, O thou king Belshazzar, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, thou hast, hast thou not glorified. Apocalyptic, or modern, Babylon is also characterized by its riches and merchandise. We read in Ezekiel 28, too, concerning Babylon under the symbol of the king of Tyre. It says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up 
and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And you may recognize these passages as referring to, to Lucifer, but Lucifer is the embodiment of Babylon. This definitely applies to Lucifer, but it literally speaking of Babylon, it's talking about apocalyptic Babylon, ma modern Babylon, in a very real way. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. In describing the corruption of Lucifer, or of, of Tyre, of modern-day Babylon, it mentions the multitude of her merchandise, the iniquity of her traffic, traffic meaning trade. Verses 11 to 17 of Revelation 18 tells us, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones of pearls, fine linen, purple scarlet, uh, purple silk, scarlet, thine wood, um, all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and brass and iron, marble, cinnamon, odors, ointments. I'm just um, summarizing. Frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen, and purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off. Why in talking about modern Babylon with all of its sins, why does it spend so much time talking about its merchandise? There's a reason. I have an article that I hope you can read in the latest issue of the 1889 Review, the, our newsletter here in Philippines. It's on our website, 1889hsda.org, and I hope you can, can get that and read it where I go into much more detail about the merchants of Babylon. This merchandise, this riches and wealth, characterizes Babylon. In Revelation 18, 7 and 8, reading again verse 7, How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Brothers and sisters, do we have the spirit of the antediluvians? Are we so caught up with our traffic, our trade, buying and selling, with our merchandise, our inventions, that we are withholding from God the means that he needs for his work to go forward? In volume 5 of the Testimonies, we read, The house where God is worshipped should be in accordance with his character and majesty. 
There are small churches that ever will be small because they place their own interests above the interests of God's cause, while they have large, convenient houses for themselves and are constantly improving their premises. How often, they say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. But the word of the Lord is to, to them is, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. How is it with my brethren and sisters in America? How much do you practice self-denial in order that you may show liberality to the needy cause of God at this time? We are doing our work here under great pressure for the want of the very money that many of the members of our churches are expending upon their own fancies in pleasing and gratifying themselves. If they had accepted the testimonies I have borne to them concerning the great want in these regions beyond, they would not be found expending one dollar in following the example of those who are multiplying pictures of themselves and their families. You would not be purchasing bicycles, which you could do without, but would be receiving the blessing of God and exercising your physical powers in a less expensive way. Instead of investing $100 in a bicycle, you would consider the matter well, lest it might be at the price of souls for whom Christ died and for whom he has made you responsible. Please read Isaiah 58 and see what is a sure remedy for poor health. Satan will contrive to bring about many devices to absorb the means which should be devoted to the cause of God at this time. Brothers and sisters, don't misunderstand me. Don't misinterpret thinking that, that this is an appeal for sending your means here. We have money. In fact, our problem is that we have entered a time now when money is almost worthless. We're entering a time when we're not going to be able to buy and sell. We, we haven't been able to, to even travel. We've been under lockdowns. Right now, they have, they're implementing in various places around, around Philippines and even around the world legislation that you will not be able to enter a grocery store or a convenience store or any type of public establishment unless you have been vaccinated. We know that the time is coming when they will merely substitute that vaccination requirement with Sunday observance. Our money is going to be useless. We should have been putting our money out to the usurers for interest a long time before now. Money that's being given to the mission field now is is almost almost too late we cannot open new fields in regions beyond for want of the very means that are used up in various ways which might be given to destitute missions night after night we have studied the perplexing problem of how we should obtain the means to advance the cause of god it rests with you in america to solve this puzzling question brothers and sisters what we what we think is our necessities are not necessities at all. I can't tell you how many times I have been in circles where Adventists were discussing preparing for the time of trouble, how they needed to earn a little more money so they could install their whole house solar system for their for their country home, and how they they had to get all the latest equipment, have everything just so, so that they could have hot water, installing their solar hot water heaters, and etc., etc. Brothers and sisters, we often haul water from the spring. We heat our water for hot water on the wood-fired stove or a charcoal-fired stove. These things are not necessary for survival. We've had, we've had a section of our wall, a 12-foot by 8-foot section, 
that's been missing that we've just had a tarp covering for three years. I'm not saying you need to have a house without a wall. It's just that we had so many other priorities, we couldn't get to that. But I'm just saying that what we view as necessities, you know, fade into insignificance when you really simplify your lives. We need to be simplifying our lives, brothers and sisters. We need to be doing without those extra conveniences. How can we have our sealed houses and all the latest conveniences of life when souls are very soon going to be receiving the seven last plagues and crying to us, why didn't you warn me? Brothers and sisters, we got to wake up to the times we're living in. Look around you. Don't you see what's happening? This, this is not going away. These, these lockdowns, this, these um, demonstrations and riots and mobs and, and chaos in the world is not going away. This is we are ushered in to the very last end of the end of time. I hope you can see that. What we do now to further the gospel work has to be done quickly. Mm -hmm.